Yo, 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 Thought Warriors. What is up? Higher Learning is on. It's Ivan Lathan Jr. And it's me, Rachel and Lindsay. Okay, so here's the thing, guys. We have a gigantic, huge show, like a really big show, because um, we are going deep into the happenings right now in the Middle East. Uh, the siege on Gaza is ongoing, and that comes after um, a really disgusting, um, indefensible terror attack that happened in Israel around a week ago. The fallout mm -hmm. from this uh, is hasn't even come into full view yet. We don't really even know how to yeah. contextualize it quite yet. So we decided to go a little heavy on this episode with three different guests who are going to talk about uh, the individual experiences that the people might be having there and also delve a little bit into some of the geopolitical questions that you guys might be having about the history of this and the present as well. Yeah. Um, I'm really proud of the show because I feel like we really try to give a larger perspective and really ask some questions that have been lingering from us and maybe fellow thought warriors as well. I will say that this show also came together at the last minute. So I'm happy that it did. We've been trying. We promised you guys the last podcast that we were going to bring someone on, but it all just kind of kind of came together in the last 30 minutes of the podcast. And I think that we bring you different points of view and cover various issues related to what's happening right now with Israel and Palestine. Yeah. So we're not going to get into too many pleasantries. We are going to do one or two other conversations on the back end. Quick, Rachel. Rachel said, quick. He you can't quick. help himself. I'm like, what? What? Quick, quick. Such I just a want to do a couple other things. Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> um, but we are going to be joined by Yair Rosenberg uh, of The Atlantic, Shibli Telhami, um, who is really well-versed uh, in uh, the happenings in that part of the world, has advised three different presidents, is a professor at the University of Maryland, also has written a handful of book, books on what's going on mm -hmm. over there as well. And we'll also be joined by Daniela Greenbaum Davis, who is a former producer for The View, um, also has contributed to places like The Washington Post and The New York Times. Uh, she is on the show, and it's an interesting conversation with her, I think a very fruitful conversation with her, about some experiences some some that she had following a tweet that she put up on Twitter. You might have saw the tweet, but it was about uh, BLM and whether or not they were a terrorist organization and who she felt like should be standing with the Jewish people. That is a harder mm -hmm. conversation. It's a more difficult conversation, but I feel like we got somewhere in the end of it. In um, the end, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I, th I, think, I think she was very open. She was willing to have the talk and uh, n nobody kowtowed. So that's great stuff. Um, and then and we're can I just say, too, what? an example what? of... What? There's just a lot of tension, and rightfully so, when it comes to some of these, you know, addressing this, and particularly on social media. And I just feel like the conversation showed respect on both ends and allowed room for each person to feel what they were feeling and also express those feelings and their thoughts and their opinions as well. So, you know, I think I, that's what makes me proud of it. Absolutely. Okay. We're going to jump into it right now. But before we do, I want to say something. Okay. And I said this in our conversation with, uh, with Daniela. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's important to say. Um, you know, I have my own thoughts about the geopolitics involved in what's happening in, um, in Israel and Gaza right now. I have my own thoughts about, uh, let me not say that. Let me tell you that this. I unequivocally believe in the freedom of the Palestinian people with no equivocation, zero equivocation. With people that are oppressed all over the world, I believe in their freedom of movement, their freedom of worship, their freedom to be equally uh, represented um, in the place that they are without equivocation, no equivocation. Um, so coming into this, you know, you look at the realities, if you've studied or if you've been at all tangential to any movements that represent the people in Gaza and the West Bank, the people of Palestine, which the United States and some other countries don't even recognize as a state. Um, and you wish that people had their eye on that region for a longer amount of time. Sure. Right? 
Um, and you want to talk about that when something like this happens. You want to talk about the daily life of somebody when something like this happens. You want to talk about it, right? You want to connect with people and go, well, you know, look how things are going. Over the last couple of days, I've had conversations with Jewish friends of mine. And I think, and I say this before, I say this when, when, we, when we were talking to Daniela, I think what maybe I missed, and I don't think that we did a bad job of discussing it here on Higher Learning or some other people missed, was that Hamas's attack, and it was Hamas's attack, it wasn't a Palestinian attack on, yeah. on in Israel. Hamas's attack on the people there, um, in addition to being destructive, uh, disgusting, barbaric, and any other adjective that you want to use to describe it, also stoked a really age-old fear in Jews all over the world. And I think what a lot of people were looking for uh, was people to put their humanity first, the humanity of our Jewish brothers and sisters, and really punch through some of the feelings that we have and just go, you know what, we're sorry that happened. And that was mm -hmm. horrible. Mm -hmm. we th we're we thinking about you. We care about you. We're sorry that happened. And that was horrible. Um, yeah. And I think as things happen on social media and in the world, I think sometimes we've been conditioned to run, we talked about this a little bit before, to run to silos and hit bunkers and not be people and human beings first. And as this continues in Gaza, we're really going to have to think about how, we're, how we become human beings first. Because what's about to happen there is going to be some of the hardest times in the region, some of the hardest times, uh, hardest things to see for people that they've, that they've seen recently. Um, and for Black people who know pain and know suffering and know what it's like to move around without equal freedom and know what it's like to move around in a place where it feels like you're hunted, it's going to be triggering for them too. So uh, we talked to Shibley uh, later on and he talks about leading with, 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 uh, with your humanity and your morals. And I want to challenge everybody, everyone to do that. Everybody to do that. But if you have a Jew in your life, uh, it wouldn't hurt to pick up the phone and call and just say, hey man, how you doing? You know? Um, and mm -hmm. the same with your Palestinian friends. Just check on everyone and try to keep it together uh, so that we can be clear-headed on what the long-term solutions in the region are. The long-term solutions in the region. Yeah. Rachel, what I, you got? I, I can't add a thing to that. You said it all. I mean, literally took the words out of my mouth. I think that's beautifully said. And it makes me even more excited real? for people to listen to this conversation, these conversations that we have. Are those necklaces real that you're wearing? Is it real? Real gold? enough. Real enough. Oh, you get you get from Claire's? That's why I used to get my stuff. I, I wouldn't even know where to find the Claire's. And yes, I did used to get my stuff from Claire's, but I wouldn't even know. You were going there, you get Claire's. I would have it on I got my, my ears shit. pierced at Claire's. Yeah. Um. Okay. Rachel. JJ Fad Supersonic. Let's get into the show. Hello. Can you hear me? I'm going to turn everything on. Was that your actual That's me. voice? Oh, whoa. You have, bro, a, you have like a, 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 a movie a, 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 commercial like an AI, voice. Bro. Like, <laughs> were, you just, were you doing that on purpose? Were you just no, saying, but hello. You just said, help, you, wait, do that again? <laughs> it's a voiceover voice, right? Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, you once you get me talking, I start talking way too fast and that goes oh, away. Oh, I'm like, Jesus, you just the, went, hello. But your hello, you it I'm was like, like a voice of God. It was like, whoa. <laughs> if this doesn't work out, you know, I can, you know, do movie trailers <laughs> or something. Okay. Um, we are staying in the Middle East right now and talking about all the happenings um, going on worldwide from a really, really, really desperate situation right now. Um, in Israel and Palestine, as we speak, uh, Israel is uh, carrying out an offensive against Hamas in Gaza. Uh, that's on the heels of one of the worst her terrorist attacks um, in civilized history. And we, we've seen that. 
uh, disgusting terrorist attack, over 1,000 Israelis dead, women, children, families. Um, and now comes uh, a political and cultural fallout that's probably going to last for a very, very long time. With us right now, we have Yair Rosenberg, a staff writer for The Atlantic, a teller of stories and a troller of Nazis, self-described on Twitter <laughs> as a troller of Nazis. He just wrote a piece in The Atlantic. We all read it was um, absolutely gut-wrenching. It was called, We're All Going to Die Here. Uh, that was the quote that I saw there at the top of it. Yeah, all right, thanks for joining us on Higher Learning today. My first question to you is, if I were to ask you right now, because I think a lot of people are trying to learn more about what's happening, why it happened, uh, and what's really going on. If I were to ask you right now, why is what's happening in uh, the Middle East happening? Just that simple question. What would be your answer to it? How long do we have? That would be my answer. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's one of those things that depending on who you're talking to, they will root it in different things, right? So I'm sure mm. if you've had these conversations online or with others, some people will point out that Israel has had a decades-long occupation of the Palestinian people, which takes place in the West Bank. They've blockaded Gaza since Hamas took over. Um, and uh, this creates tremendous amounts of uh, grievance among the Palestinian population, which seeks its own sovereignty. Um, and then, of course, you will have other people who will point to Hamas in particular and say, look at their charter, their founding documents and their actions, right? Their charter is this insane cartoonish melange of anti-Semitic ideas. It says that the Jews want to take over the world. It says, it quotes the protocols of the elders of Zion. A lot of the conspiracy theories we actually hear here in the United States, um, cited by like white supremacists who shoot up, you know, Jewish places, churches, other places, um, are echoed in this bizarre document. Um, and so people will point to that. And part of what I do in my journalism is point out that both these things are true at the same time, right? You can have a group that has legitimate national aspirations and legitimate grievances with how it's been treated by what is an increasingly hard right Israeli government, right? And at the same time, there could be a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism, which has sort of empowered that far right Israeli government in response, right? And so these sort of things, they can often feed off each other. Um, and so, yeah, so why is it all happening though? Like that, it depends who you're talking to and they'll give you different answers. Uh, but those are the two things. And I just, what I would just say to people is, I'm not going to be your ultimate arbiter. I would just say, be suspicious of people who tell you it's an either or as opposed to a both and, right? Because when you see what Hamas just did, you're like, you might have some like legitimate grievances with Israeli policy, but that in no universe can justify. And I'm going to start, I'm going to warn people that I'm going to start describing things a little graphically, but you have to understand um, what reporters are seeing, some which is not circulating publicly, but people should hear, right? Executing a grandmother in her home, filming it, filming it on her cell phone, and then uploading it to her Facebook page so that her family and friends would see it, right? Mm -hmm. Kidnapping toddlers, right? And taking them to Gaza, where, and then posting videos of them being taunted by other children. Um, and remember, these kids don't know where they are, and they also don't understand Arabic. And these, their other kids are being encouraged to taunt and bully them, and then uploading a video of that to social media. I don't recommend looking these up. Um, you have people burned alive. Um, you're seeing some controversy on social media about beheadings. I can tell you now that they've released photos. People have been beheaded. What exactly the age is, the fact that this is being debated is kind of crazy. People have been beheaded. Many, many children and babies were just murdered, right, with bullets, regardless of how the manner of it. Um, people were suffocated, uh, like when they like locked themselves in rooms, so they burned down the house and they suffocated. Um, it's, it's, you know, reporters who have gone to the scene and you might have seen on TV say it's like the worst thing they've ever seen. Um, and this happened to, you mentioned a thousand people, it's risen to a thousand two hundred, but it's actually higher. Uh, the reason is they mm. haven't found all the bodies. And when they do find the bodies, they have to sometimes reassemble them to identify them. They haven't done that yet. Right. So it's actually, you know, it, it's really hard to like grasp. That's not a national, you know, movement. There are many national movements in the world that have many, many grievances. They don't resort to that. That's that's sadism that masquerades as nationalism, and it's similar to the way Hamas calls itself an Islamic movement. But I'm pretty sure most Muslims, you know, abhor this sort of stuff and think it's absolutely awful, right? And so, when a group wraps itself in a religion, we know that that doesn't mean it represents the religion. It can also wrap itself in a national cause, which doesn't mean it represents the national cause. It's kind of crucial to not allow these sorts of things to just easily mix. So that's a, a somewhat longer answer. Hmm. Yeah, um, I, I really like and appreciate that you talked about the both and. 
Um, because a lot of this has been, you know, back and forth with social media and, and rightfully so it's personal for so many people. And, you know, you see some people, um, uh, putting on social media, talking about condemning one thing, but then also speaking to the humanity of it. And I've seen a lot on social media where the people who do kind of talk about the both and are called anti-Semitic. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that because I'm seeing a lot of that rhetoric out there. And I know you write about this. So I've seen more that the people who are uh, who are called anti-Semitic are people who are rallying and saying, well, this is just what resistance looks like. This is what decolonization looks like. You thought it was going to be pretty. You thought it was just a metaphor, right? We mean by any means necessary, right? And I think it is important to distinguish that between someone who says, I'm just talking about both ends and I want to see the whole situation, right? And I may balance it in one way or another and people can strongly disagree about that, but I'm acknowledging the anti-Semitism, right? And I'm acknowledging the brutality and I'm not apologizing for it. I'm not excusing it. This is the worst act of anti-Jewish violence since the Holocaust, right? If you can't just say this was evil, full stop, right? There is something mm-hmm. wrong, right? There is something wrong. And like, so that is what I think is properly deemed anti-Semitic. And there are people, there are rallies that are happening around the country in support of this, which is, you know, we have free speech in the country. And that's, that's actually a very good thing, right? And people should be allowed to do things like that, uh, but we should also take note, right? People, you, you, have, you have learned something about someone who's willing to do that. Um, but that shouldn't be conflated with someone who wants to talk about the broader picture. Um, but people should also recognize there are intense sensitivities around this. And you might say not just exactly the right way and other people might misinterpret you. And there is some value in sometimes saying, I can't speak, right? Sometimes social mm-hmm. media compels us. Everyone's talking about this thing. I must talk about it too, right? I'm now, yesterday I was a Ukraine expert. The day before I was a COVID expert, right? And now I'm an Israel-Palestine expert. And you don't have to be. Right. And I think sometimes it's the, the, you can talk and have these conversations, not in public, right, with friends and colleagues and things like that. And that can be a much more healthy way. It's not just true about this. Right. So it's my job as a journalist to talk about it, to explain it and to be in that space. Um, but if you're an average person, you don't have to, you know, and you might say this looks really, really hard to discuss in public. And that's okay. I sometimes feel like that after, you know, mass shootings in the United States and other things where like everyone's just extremely raw. And do you really feel the social yeah. media conversation is making it better? Right. Mm. And sometimes I feel like not so much. Um, and so, yeah, mm. so I also feel like people, if they disengage, but can try to learn on their own without, you know, doing it in public, that that's perfectly fine. There are times, though, where if you don't say anything, your silence is your silence is deafening. Your silence is you're complicit um, to where it feels yeah. like you're compelled to take a stand and people want to know what you think. I would distinguish between individuals, right, and institutions, mm-hmm. right? So an individual, like you, you know, random person with a Twitter feed, like you shouldn't feel like you're having, you have to have a PR operation where you're like constantly putting out statements about what you think about things. Um, but like, say you're a university, right, or a sports league, and you put out statements about other events. And we have seen lots of institutions do that over the years. So when they don't say something, right, it's noticeable, right? Again, biggest act of anti-Jewish violence since the Holocaust. And you can't get yourself to like actually say, this is just bad, full stop, right? People notice and they say, it'd be one thing if you just didn't put out statements and that wasn't your thing. You're like, you know, uh, we're the NFL and we don't say anything about stuff, right? And, you know, that would be a stance and that would be a position. But if you, once you've already started doing things, right? Once you're like a university president and you've been putting out statements all year about many different events around the world and emailing the student body, then, you know, people will notice when you don't. Um, And so, I, yeah, but I think the average person should not feel the need, right? And I think that, we sometimes do this. We look at like, why haven't you said something on your Instagram, right? People are not the sum total of what they put on Instagram, but what they put on Twitter. Um, and I feel like that's a that, that that's something that we could learn, like in general, not just on this issue. Is there mm-hmm. a difference? I'm um, slightly touchy question. Is sure. there a difference between anti-Jewish violence and anti-Israel violence? Is there a difference between criticizing Israel? and criticizing Jews is a lot of people feel like sometimes when they get caught into talking about the government and the state of Israel, that all of those things become attacks on Jews worldwide. Help us understand whether or not there are differences or whether or not um, those, those things can't really exist in any bifurcated way. Yeah, so that's um, those are two very good questions. So I'll ask the, the the easy one first, so to speak, which is: Is there a difference between attacks um, on Jews and like criticism of Jews and criticism of Israel? And the answer is obviously yes, because Israel is a state, a state actor. It has guns, right, and borders and institutions, right, and just like the United States, right, and China and many others. And uh, when you have power, you can abuse that power, and people can speak to that. And you're not, you know, anti-Chinese when you criticize China, 
right? Now, that being said, sometimes people can lapse from criticizing China into just going after Chinese people and we see this, right? Or you are angry at some Muslim country or, you know, or an extremist group like ISIS, and then you go and attack some Muslims in a mosque, which is a thing that happens, right? And sadly has happened, you know, in North America. Um, happens to Jews all the time, right? People are angry at something that they perceive Israel to be doing, and they attack Jews all around the world, right? So that jump you, you cannot make. Um, is there a difference between, what was the first the first question you asked? The first question was when you say this is Jewish violence, and it is. I'm not, yeah, I'm, Ju- I'm not, I'm not well, anti-Jewish violence and anti-Israeli violence. Yeah. Anti-Israeli violence, yeah. Yeah, and so that that is, you know, that's a contextual question um, because the, sometimes people are attacking Israelis Right, because they're attacking them because they're the Israeli state, like we just discussed. Right. But sometimes, like in the case of Hamas, if you look at their founding documents and everything they say about Jews and all the stuff, you attack them. And the way you can treat them like subhuman is because they are anti-Semites. Right. They don't consider Jews to be human beings. They consider them to be a stain on the land. They don't want to share the land. They want the Jews gone. Um, and so like you get a very different thing. And so you sort of have to be able to say, like, okay, sometimes it is going to be anti-Israeli and sometimes it's done anti-Jewish, and they just happen to be the Jews who are there, right? And they're Israeli Jews. Um, and so, and the other complicating factor is that, um, Israel is now home to half the world's Jews total. We don't have a lot of Jews in general in the world. We're 2% of the American population, 0.2% of the world population. Half the world's Jews are in Israel. If you're the sort of person who doesn't like Jews, like say you're a white supremacist, well, like Israel is like the mother load of all the Jews. So of course you're going to hate Israel, right? So there are some people who hate Israel, right? And want to hurt it or, you know, encourage violence against it because they hate Jews and they see it as like the best, you know, target, right? And it's the embodiment of all the stuff they hate. Um, and so you get this confusion where there are people having a legitimate conversation criticizing Israeli state policy and then other people who show up to that same party and they're like, yeah, I also really hate Israel and I also want to, you know, I don't boycott them out of existence and various other things, right? And people who don't ask, they come to your door and you don't card them because it seems like they agree with you. But then you discover, oh, they also think the Jews did not let it right? And they also think the Holocaust didn't happen, right? And all these other things that they bring with them that because, but have nothing to do with what you thought you were having the conversation about. And then they sort of, they basically pervert the conversation. They corrupt it. Um, and then it becomes impossible because then you start like, who is legit in this conversation? Who's trying to have a reasonable, real political conversation? And who is having an anti-Semitic conversation? So that's one of the reasons why like, mm-hmm. it's so important to make these distinctions. And when you're engaged in criticizing the Israeli state, you have to like make sure that the people you're working with and your allies right, are not coming to it from the wrong place. Because one, they could corrupt the conversation that's inherently bad, but two, just if you're thinking strategically, their anti-Semitism will be used to discredit the legitimate things you say, right? Because you might say, mm-hmm. the Israeli government did X, Y, and Z, and this is really bad. And then somebody else in your group is posting anti-Semitic memes on Facebook, and people will say, well, we don't have to listen to this group. Look, there's an anti-Semite in the group. So right. should a purely strategic level, right? But I also think just to emphasize, it's morally wrong, right? And like, we should be more careful. But I think in a lot of times in politics, and I see this as a political reporter, I cover, you know, American politics, um, people build alliances with people who share like a particular thing they, they agree upon. And they, and if the person agrees with you on a key issue, you don't ask too many questions. Right. right? So there can, because you, you know, need so you can them. Have, yeah, because you need them. Yeah. And like, so you could be somebody who really, really, really wants to uh, impose more policy consequences on Israel for the Netanyahu government. And so you, people show up and they build your coalition and you don't ask too many questions as to why they're there. And it comes back to bite you. And you also have people who support Israel who they're like, oh, you're really against the Palestinians. Well, that seems fine, right? You're really critical. Turns out you hate Muslims, but we didn't look so carefully and too late. Now you're part of our team, right? And so mm. you often see this sort of thing and it would the discourse would be a lot healthier, right? If we were able to sort of ask a few questions before we just let people into our tent. Um, and I have a benefit. It's easy for me to say this. I'm a journalist. I am a, a voice of one and I can say whatever I want. <laughs> And I'm responsible for what I say. Being an institution, obviously, and building a movement, it can be a lot harder, right? But I think you see sometimes uh, that we haven't built our movement so well, and then suddenly it ex- a moment like this happens. And again, you see some people cheerleading mass murder, and then there are other people who thought they were their allies, right? And they're like, wait a second, that's not what I signed up for at all. Like, I'm really critical of the Israeli state, right? But that is not what I thought we were doing together, right? And now you're having these sort of intra-left fights. There's been some good writing on this in New York Magazine by Eric Levitz and uh, um, Zach Beecham in Vox. Um, and this is a conversation that's happening on the left when people are realizing that some of them thought they were aligned on this, but they're not. Um, but if you card at the door earlier, you're probably less likely to have that happen in the first place. I want to talk about the military and the government since you mentioned that. And um, yeah. Van asked you the why. I want to more so go on the how, because we've seen a lot of people talk about 
um, the Israeli government and be very critical of um, yeah. the policies of Netanyahu. And so I'm wondering, and I've seen some conflicting reports, and I'm wondering what you know in regards to the failure from the military and the government in, uh, with these attacks. And so yeah. I'm wondering, you know, what you know about that is, are these reports true in regards to the Israeli government was warned that something like this could happen? And then going back to my original question, how does something like this happen? A huge question. It's the biggest um, failure of the Israeli state since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. That's 50 years ago, almost to the day, when uh, Egypt uh, surprise attacked Israel um, and almost won. Right. And then the Israel succeeded and pushed back and ended up winning that war, but it was very dicey. Um, and they did it on the holiest day of the Jewish year. And this attack took place on Simchat Torah, another important Jewish holiday. Right. So there's a lot of echoes and also this incredible failure. And people want to know why. So there are initial reports that Egyptian intelligence in some way had inkling that something was going on. And a few days before it warned, um, sent message to Netanyahu. Um, it's, I haven't seen that myself, so I don't know as a reporter. Um, it could be true. I wouldn't be surprised if there were stuff that they're going to find when they do an inquiry. Like when we looked into 9-11, we discovered that there were analysts who had heard stuff, right? But not all intelligence filters up to the right people. People say, oh, this is noise, or we don't trust this source, right? A bad decision gets made somewhere in the line. And that gets to the Netanyahu government and who's actually running it, which is over the years, Netanyahu has drifted more and more to the right and had to rely more and more on hard right parties to stay in power. Um, he used to build more centrist governments, but then he he went on trial for corruption, and a lot of them were centrist, um, and even right-wing parties were like, and le not to mention left-wing, were like, it's a parliamentary democracy, so you have to make team, team up with other parties to govern. And they're like, we're not going to sit with you while you're on trial. So the only people who would sit with him are these like fringe far-right parties. Um, and these people, besides being like fringe far-right people with often, you know, racist and chauvinist views towards uh, Palestinians, um, they're just, they've never been in Israeli governments. They don't have governing experience. They're not very good at their jobs. They're mostly demagogues. Um, and so he has a lot of cronies in this sort of government, like in charge of stuff, nominally, but not very good. And the thought was, well, the security agencies and the army, well, they run themselves sort of. And so you could have like, and this sort of sounds sort of familiar in the United States, which is that when Donald Trump puts some really weird people who are not always particularly competent, right, running stuff, but the state can still function, right? And the question is, how much can you do that before something gets lost, something bad happens, right? And I think we could sort of perhaps draw some conclusions about what might happen if, say, Donald Trump wins the second term and who would be running stuff and what could fall through the cracks when you have these people on top. Um, so on the one side, you have this massive failure. Somebody, either they missed intelligence or they just were deceived by Hamas dramatically. Um, but on the other side, you might have read, like in my story, you have these stories of like individual acts of Israeli heroism where like, oh, like the institutions are falling down and people are getting murdered left and right. Um, and so like in my story, um, uh, a friend of mine who's an Israeli journalist at a left-wing paper um, was rescued by his 60 year old 62 year old father right who came and drove down and then linked up with another retired general who had also just put on his uniform and came to try to help people and you have so many stories of these things where people basically just came out of retirement right and went to rescue people um and what's most remarkable about it actually is that like his you know when he's like stuck in like they're hiding in their house right and they have all the lights off and they're with their this is my journalist friend and they're with their uh three-year-old and their one-year-old and they've told them you have to be absolutely quiet when you can't make a sound, you, we're not going to eat, can't go to the bathroom. And they're like this for 10 hours. Um, they lose all power. They're in the dark. Um, and the air is getting thin because they're locked in like a safe room, which is just a concrete room. It's not like when you think of a fancy safe room. It's just a concrete reinforced room. Um, but they texted his father and his father said, my mother, you know, your mother and I were coming to get you. Right. And he starts driving down. And the thing is, they start driving down, but they keep running into other people who've been wounded or injured, right? And who need help. So they keep driving people back to the hospital. They don't just go straight, they keep helping other people, right? And they, uh, they pick up, you know, this, these people who were, you know, attacked but survived this uh, concert where hundreds of people were, were massacred. Um, and they drive them to the hospital. And eventually they give away, the, the mother takes the car and drives some people to the hospital. So now the, the, um, my friend's dad doesn't have a car. But then he finds this other retired Israeli general and he says, my granddaughters, right? Are, are locked up, right? And I need to go rescue them. Um, I need your car. Can you come with me? Right. And they get in this car and it's not a Jeep, 
It's not an armored vehicle. It's just a car like you drive to work and they're driving through a war zone, right? And they drive up there. And when they get to the, the, the town, right, they meet up and they see there's a special forces unit that's preparing to go house to house to try to clear all the places of booby traps and of militants who are in there, right? And which is the most dangerous part of counterterrorism, which is also the sort of thing we're going to see if Israel does a ground invasion of Gaza, right? They're going to be doing that in Gaza. And it's very scary. And often you end up with civilian casualties because people can't tell who is who. Um, and so they go house to house, right? And, uh, you know, as my friend tells it in the story, um, they, they know that something's happening because now there's not one kind of gunfire, there's two kinds of gunfire and it's getting closer and closer. So there's clearly a fight, right? And then mm. they, uh, hear, an, you know, a knock on the window and they hear their grandfather's voice and, uh, his, his, you know, three year old daughter says, Saba Higia, grandfather is here. And then they knew they were safe. Do you think there will be a ground offensive in Gaza? In Gaza? Um, all the signs are that yes, right? Because basically, here's the thing. What does that right? What does that mean for the region? Um, I mean, for the region, hard to say, right? If it expands, like say if other groups get involved, and specifically the group that people are looking at is Hezbollah, which is another, um, <laughs> it's a Lebanese militia. It's not Palestinian. It doesn't have a significant territorial dispute with Israel. It's a, a proxy group that's funded and trained by Iran that's on Israel's northern border based in Lebanon. Um, they've killed a lot of people, most of them not Jews, actually most of them uh, other Muslims uh, in service of like Bashar Assad and others. Um, but they have a much more sophisticated rocket arsenal, much better training, um, and much better weaponry. Um, and they are so far sitting out. Um, um, that's part of why Israel sort of is going into Gaza because you need to keep groups like that deterred. But they're in the north and mm. Gaza's in the south. And if they decide to join in, Israel would be fighting a war on two fronts, right? And so it's hard to know if they are planning. Right now, that's when you're listening to like, President Biden speak and talk about our like ironclad support for Israel, right? It's both an emotional and true thing for him, but it's also geostrategic, which is what they don't want is Israel finding a two front war with two Iranian proxies that would essentially lead to like a sort of Israel war with Iran because these are two Iranian funded groups um, that are basically being directed by Iran in different ways, right? Whether or not Iran ordered this specific terrorist attack, which is totally separate, which is a subject of investigation and reporters don't know, but. Uh, everyone knows it's very public, you know, that the leaders of, of Hezbollah and Hamas, they regularly meet with Iran and they get their money from Iran and they get some training from Iran. Um, and so if Iran, they're trying to warn Iran, basically, you know, Biden's like, don't test me, right? Don't test me. They move warships in proximity. They're like, do not have Hezbollah start up a thing. They don't, U.S. does not want a large, a larger war that control in the U.S. It control in other countries, right? They want to keep it restricted to Israel, Gaza. And so if Israel goes in on the ground invasion, it's just in Gaza, it would be horrific, right? For Israelis and for Palestinians, right? but it will be just horrific for them, right? And at this point, that is sort of what, like, part of what the, you know, diplomatic community is just trying to contain it to. But Israel can't basically, like, people come in and, like, murder 1,200 people more of your citizens in a country that's, you know, less than 10 million people, right? Which is proportionally much larger than, say, 9-11, right? They have to stop. And, like, like Obama, President Obama said, I think, in his tweet, dismantle Hamas. Like, you have to do, you just can't, they can't live next to that. You can't live next to the, you know, eliminationist neighbor next door. Um, but the question is how you do that. And Hamas has said people over, uh, you know, I think people no longer underestimate Hamas, but you shouldn't underestimate their prowess in their own turf, right? Where they know the layout, right? They know where all of the hideaways are. They can booby trap things, right? And they also have built a lot of subterranean tunnels. You sometimes see this meme on social media that says the Israelis, oh, it's nice. They have bomb shelters, but the Gazans don't. The Gazans do, in fact, have lots of subterranean shelters and, and tunnels. And you can look up articles and read about these, but they're used for Hamas fighters and for their smuggling and for their arms caches. They don't put civilians in them, right? The civilians get on top and they basically are in the way, right? And that's done on purpose, right? To make it harder to get to Hamas. Um, and so they're going to have a real urban warfare advantage uh, over the Israelis who come in, even the very highly trained Israelis. Um, and so it's going to be a really, that's why Israel hasn't gone into the, on a ground offensive in Gaza in like 10 years, because Netanyahu does not want to do it, right? It is something that is going to lead to a lot of people dying, uh, both Palestinian and Israeli, um, you know, and that's why it's so tragic and scary. Um, and I'm sure like if you've watched, like, you know, there's so many people in Gaza who are just caught in the middle of this and they aren't getting out. They're trying to get Egypt to open the border and work with Israel. So because like, people don't understand that like, Gaza is bordered by Israel, but also by Egypt. And so the Gaza blockade is by both of them. Um, and obviously Israel's at war on its border. So like that, like Hamas is shooting at them, they're shooting at Hamas. But you could let people out theoretically into Egypt, but Egypt is resisting letting people in. Um, and it's not clear where the Israelis stand on that, but Egypt itself has long resisted letting Palestinians into its territory for a whole bunch of geopolitical reasons. Yeah. Um, 
And so like, but then where do the refugees go? Right. In this exactly. very, very small place, you know? And so it's like, but you know, but at the same time, Israel can't like just sit there and say, well, you just tried to like genocide us. We're just going to like, you know, drop a few bombs and airstrikes and then we'll negotiate. Um, how far do you think, how far do you think it is? Uh, um, how, how far can Israel go in your opinion? Meaning, um, what is satisfactory? What is, well, I mean, what do you think? I think what they want, well, what they're saying and what, you know, people are calling for is to just make it impossible for Hamas to ever do this again, which could mean getting, you know, like really deposing the group. It could just mean hobbling it to the extent that it no longer can, can like run Gaza and other groups will, will take over. Remember, they're like a dictatorial group that seized power basically permanently in 2007, never held another election. That's an important fact to understand when you say, people say, well, all Gazans are responsible for what Hamas does. They, they, I'll tell you just one story. There's a, there was a Gazan peace activist during COVID who did a two hour Zoom call with Israeli leftists who were like, you know, basically their dream is to have some sort of Israeli Palestinian joint state, which is a really, especially now, sort of a pipe dream, but like a peace dream. And they talked for two hours on Zoom. Nothing happened to the Israelis, of course. Uh, this activist was, um, imprisoned for six months by Hamas. They tortured him and they forced him to divorce his wife. That's what they do to dissenters. Right. And that's what they do to maintain power. Right. Um, because, and why were they so incensed by somebody like having a conversation with Israelis about living in a state together? Because that's antithetical to their whole worldview. That's very dangerous to them. Um, but like, that's also why, like, you can, like, you cannot really know what Gazans think of Hamas because that's what they do if they told you what they really think. So some of them definitely support Hamas, but some of them don't, but, and can't tell you. Um, and so no one really knows what the day after Hamas looks like, uh, in Gaza. Uh, but if they're not shooting rockets anymore, and they're not, you know, making incursions over the border anymore. That's basically what, and Israel is going to try to recover the hostages. Cause remember, there are some 100 to 150 people kidnapped in Gaza, uh, civilians, most of them. And, uh, you know, it's really hard to know how they can possibly rescue them, to be honest, right? Because how can you fight a war, right? And also protect the hostages at the same time, right? It's just sort of like plays right into Hamas's hands, right? So, it could be ugly. Hamas is threatened to uh, execute the hostages live, um, live streaming it basically, uh, which, you know, you should know that if you're like using social media platforms like Instagram or TikTok, uh, there have been notes that have been sent out to Jewish schools around the world that encouraging parents to like talk to their kids about it and maybe even remove the apps because you might encounter snuff films depending on how this goes. Um, you already can encounter horrific things without even any of that. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, it's been, yeah. it's been unavoidable. Yeah. Um, really quickly, can I just ask you, um, I know you talked about Netanyahu and I think I heard you right in regards to, uh, coming in into the land and having to attack in that way and, um, the lives of civilians. Do you think that it's possible that they would lift the blockade, whether it's Israel, Egypt, or both in order to protect or, uh, refugees and, and allow civilians to, you know, flee rather than just be blocked in while this war is happening. So that's clearly a geostrategic objective of, uh, Anthony Blinken, right? The U.S. Secretary of State who's in the region right now. The U.S. is trying to negotiate that. Um, Egypt has to agree to it, right? Israel does, but particularly Egypt does because Egypt controls the crossing. And apparently that hasn't happened yet. Um, Israel cannot, you know, lift the blockade because like, okay, People can now come as refugees and then Hamas people just come across the border, right? Obviously, and also the, the war is on that border, but the war is not on the Egyptian border, right? So that would be the place that you'd want to open and create some sort of refugee cordon. Um, but right now they haven't succeeded in doing it. Um, at the same time, the ground offensive hasn't happened yet, so we'll, we'll see. And Israel is not going to go in until it's ready um, because you don't rush into something. As I said, there's a lot of advantages that Hamas has in that in that region um, and, uh, they don't, and no one's going to underestimate them. Um, and so there is still time to try to figure something out. Um, but of course they're, they're still right now they're shooting rockets at Israel and Israel's bombing right back. And so civilians are still already, they're already caught in all of this. Um, and like, it's just, uh, and this is what gets back to the sort of bo- another both and, which is there's nothing contradictory about concern for civilians in Gaza, right? And concern for all of the Israelis who've been massacred, traumatized, and these Israelis who are kidnapped. They're, that's, in fact, expressions in my mind of the same values. Hmm. Last question. Mm-hmm. Um, Israel has cut off electricity, fuel, um, and the Gazans are uh, obviously suffering. They're, yeah. they're running out of medical supplies. The hospitals are barren at this point. Um, it's a humanitarian nightmare. Some people even wondering whether or not that in and of itself is a violation of international law. Um, 
your thoughts on that? Your thoughts on the strategy of starving the people out? So the the idea is to basically deprive Hamas of as many resources as possible. Um, you know that that will be what if you ask you know strategic planners, that's what they're doing. They're like a siege means a siege, right? And we're not going to uh, you know give them assets, especially if like they're going to be planning booby traps or setting stuff up. We want to make it really hard for them to do stuff like that. But it inevitably falls upon everybody else as well. Um, as to international law, you, you should ask a, a legal expert, um, and I'm sure there will be plenty weighing in on the tactics of everything that happens in the days ahead. Um, but I will say this does tell you something about Hamas because once again, like it, you may notice, like wait a second, they're getting all their water, right, and all of their electricity and a bunch of these other things from Israel, right? This enemy state. What is going on? And once again, it's because Hamas doesn't govern the Strip, right? They don't serve the people. They didn't build infrastructure. They had many, many years to actually build things for their people. And instead, they spent it building rockets and a war machine and a subterranean tunnel, you know, maze that they can use. And so what you end up with is now like when Israel, you're reliant on Israel for all these things, Israel can cut them off, right? And like there were proposals to do all sorts of stuff to build uh, in Gaza, like the economy and various other things. And Hamas in general just sort of skims all of the money, right? And takes the stuff and then uses it for what they want. There's this uh, bonkers video where they like they posted this themselves. Hamas was celebrating it. They were showing off how they build rockets despite the blockade. They were digging up pipes in Gaza and turning them into rockets, which on the one hand is ingenious, and on the other hand is of course dismantling infrastructure, right, mm-hmm. in order to f- mm-hmm. make a war machine. Um, and so you know it's sort of this like horrible situation that's been building for a very long time, and like now it all comes to a head. Yeah, here. Yeah. Thank you, brother. We appreciate you, man. We appreciate Thank your you. reporting. We yeah. appreciate you making the time for us. No, it's a tough time. Um, where yeah. can they catch you? Where can they find you? Um, so I write for The Atlantic. Uh, so you'll see my stuff at theatlantic.com. Uh, I have a newsletter, which is called Deep Shtetl, which is uh, a word I should spell. S-H-T-E-T-L. <laughs> yes. um, it's Yiddish. Exactly. Well recognized. Um, <laughs> and so, and, and I don't usually write. Here's the thing. And this is, you know, I write about world events, so I cover it. So I don't usually write about Israel. I cover many other things, many things that I think are far less depressing. Um, you know, and then I'm on all the social media sites, uh, you know, though, if you're not on them, as you know, you're probably doing it better than me. So. <laughs> all right, man, <laughs> we appreciate you making time for us today on Higher yeah. Learning, bro. I appreciate the good work. Well, thank, thank you for having you. me on and for the questions. Continuing our coverage of the happenings right now over in the Middle East, um, as we speak, uh, things are dire. Very serious um, for the Gazan people. Also, the Israeli people, the Jews all over the world are reeling from an unprecedented terror attack that has left over 1,000. I think the number is up to 1,200 Jews, um, Israelis dead. Uh, and, you know, just untold carnage from a surprise attack from Hamas. We have someone joining us right now, another guest, Shibli Talami, who is incredibly distinguished here, the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development, a distinguished scholar and the director of the University of Maryland's Critical Issues Poll, um, wrote the book, The World Through Arab Eyes. So we appreciate you joining us on Higher Learning today. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess that's my first question. The name of your book is very poignant, The World Through Arab Eyes. How do you think Arab eyes see right now, all over the world, what's happening um, in Gaza and Israel? Um, First of all, um, you know, this is a a bloody time, a very, very painful uh, war time. And we know uh, during war, the hearts harden and you focus only on your own and you don't focus on the other. And I want to say, you know, that, you know, from my perspective, when I'm looking at what's happening now, um, the painful, yeah, the painful killings. The most striking thing is uh, the 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 level of innocent civilian casualties that are just shocking. Uh, there is no cause uh, that justifies targeting civilians or recklessly undermining them or jeopardizing them. Uh, and I think it doesn't matter whether it's Israelis or Palestinians. Uh, we need to find a way to spare civilians. There are political conflict that had to be fought, but you have to make sure you minimize civilian casualties. In the last five days so far, 
we have 12,000 people dead or wounded between Palestinians mm-hmm. and Israelis, about over 76,000 Palestinians and over uh, 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 7,600 Palestinians and over 4,200 Israelis. There are 300,000 Palestinians who have been rendered homeless from the bombings on Gaza that followed Hamas's attack. 300,000, and most of these are people who have, uh, uh, most of them are are already refugees or descendants of refugees from 1948 uh, from their original homes in what is now central Israel. And they're rendered homeless again, and there'll be thousands more, trust me, unfortunately, before this is over. Uh, So there's a context. The context is, it's not just about Hamas and the fighting and what happened in Israel and the surprise, which is ugly enough, but it is the political conflict that surrounds this issue. 56 years of occupation in the West Bank and Gaza uh, and and no end in sight uh, and rising settler violence in the West Bank. So when the Arab population is looking at it, they're looking at it through the prism of the pain of the Palestinians. And so they empathize and and hearts harden uh, toward uh, Israeli casualties. As we see in Israel, just after this attack, which was um, uh, resulted in, in thousands of casualties, uh, what you see is many Israelis say, carpet bomb, destroy. And we see the result, obviously, in how many casualties civilian casualties have been on the other side. So what we need is political leaders who rise above this pain, who rise above the demonization, who rise above the hardening of the hearts, who focus on the human condition. There's time for politics. We need to deal with it, the strategy. But right now, we shouldn't differentiate between a Jewish victim and an Arab victim, an Israeli victim and Palestinian victim. Color shouldn't be the factor. This is a human issue, and we need to focus on that. And our need, leaders need to speak with moral authority, not just against the violence that, that killed innocent Israeli civilians, which is awful and must be stopped and condemned. Um, but we cannot allow uh, the reckless endangerment of so many civilians uh, in Gaza right now. There's a humanitarian disaster unfolding that might last for generations. And so we need to speak with a single moral authority on this. When you see um, the secretary, U.S. Secretary of State, who's over there today and made a statement, a very personal statement um, in his connection to his stepfather, and his grandfather, and them being Jewish, and you see him standing next to um, Netanyahu, I'm wondering what do these statements, and even that coupled with uh, President Biden's statement. What do these statements say? How are these interpreted um, from the Arab world? And in any way, does their allegiance or their allyship stoke any fires? Um, well, first of all, the Secretary of State is is a fine man. He's an American, um, and we all have you know uh, all Americans, whether they're Jewish or Arab. Or uh, black or white, um, uh, we're all Americans, and 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 he all, only represents the United States of America. Has every right to his history, to his feelings, and and this is a time where he can invoke that. Um, that that's that's that should. There's nothing wrong with that, honestly. I think sure. this is he's speaking for the United States. Um, I think the the question is how it is seen on the other side. There will be people who will exploit that, obviously. Um, uh, and by the way, I don't think the Secretary of State makes the policy. Mm-hmm. I mean, by the way, I mean, right now on this issue, Israel-Palestine, and I've written, as you know, you, you've only mentioned one book. I've written three books on American foreign policy in the Middle East. I've advised four different American administrations, two Republican yeah, and two Democrats. So I'm I'm looking at it through the American, I'm, I'm an American, obviously, and I'm looking at it through mm-hmm. the prism. I'm an Arab-American. But I'm looking at it through the prism of, of um, you know, American foreign policy. Um, sure. I think that um, presidents make policy on this issue because it's politically too overwhelming for anybody else. And on this particular issue, 
the president whom I've known over the years, both when he was a senator and he was vice president, he has his very strong views on this issue. And, and he has been the one who's guiding policy. And of course, he's now in a presidential campaign. So no one mm-hmm. touches this issue except for him. So he's only representing the president when he's doing that. And he can invoke his own personal, but that's not the way necessarily it'll be received by some who want to pick issues with him about his identity. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you to do something that is very layered. And if you can even do it in an abridged way, that's fine. If you want to punt on it, that's fine as well. For people who don't understand uh, the history of the animus in this region, could you give them a brief rundown of what has happened to get things to this point since around 48 or even before then? There are so many people that are saying things like, we, have, you know, we had a fantastic conversation on this podcast earlier on with someone who said, you know, this is thousands and thousands of years old. And it's just not, right? So for people that don't understand the history contextually of what's happening here, could you give them an expert, a brief rundown of how things got to this point? No, uh, because there's no brief history that can do justice to the story. Um, uh, What I will say, though, is that American policy has been based um, theoretically on the idea of two-state solution. That is that um, Israel came to occupy territories uh, that uh, it now holds, um, including the West Bank and Gaza, that are theoretically under, including Gaza, which is theoretically under Israeli o- occupation. Uh, and the U.S. has pushed, the U.S. and the international community for now a uh, couple of decades have pushed for the establishment of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza uh, side by side with Israel. That has become practically impossible because my most recent book that you can see up on the shelf uh, is called the One State Reality. What is Israel Palestine? It's co-edited with three other scholars. Um, it, it just becomes so impossible to have because the encroachment of Israeli settlements, particularly, that's one thing that, that were built on the occupied ter- territory, which is illegally under international law. They've been, I was there last week. They're all over the place. I mean, cities like Bethlehem and Beit Zahor, Beit Jala, they're not too far from Jerusalem. They're surrounded by settlements, really impossible to figure out how you could separate them to create a separate state. Uh, they're like Bandu stands across the entire West Bank right now. So uh, I think what, um, what um, uh, you know, everybody's been grappling with this for some time. That's why I, we have, my colleagues and I uh, put together this project that led to the book uh, about the one state reality. Right now, we need to focus on equality. Uh, we need to focus on people getting dignified rights, to getting freedom. Uh, political entity, whatever political entity um, emerges, uh, whether it's a confederation, two states, one state, we need to focus on on uh, freedom for both people, freedom for Palestinians, freedom for for Israelis. Um, but this is not going to be a time for it, obviously, because right now we're in the middle of a disaster, and this disaster is going to create new conditions. We don't really yet know what they're going to look like. Um, obviously, in Gaza, unless um, unless somebody intervenes to stop it, um, we can have a calamity on a new scale um, that will have be of historic proportions that might uh, defo- redefine the conflict one more time, uh, and that's. Uh, even without what might still happen, which is uh, this war expanding to include Hezbollah in in the north. Um, Hezbollah is a very powerful organization that's uh, tied to Iran. Um, It's much more powerful than Hamas. Um, They are not about to enter the war. It's not in their interest. It's not in the Israeli interest. Everybody's trying to prevent that from happening. But they could be dragged into it because of the, the scale of fighting in Gaza and victim and pressure, public opinion, um, mistakes of signaling. They could be dragged in. And if they're dragged in, you have another devastating war in the north for both Israelis and especially Lebanese. Um, you know, and, and most of the victims, trust me, will always be civilian. Helpless civilians get hurt the most. And that's before even thinking about the possibility of involvement from Iran or the U.S. being drawn in. So we're this is not a small event. This is not a small event. It's a it's obviously a devastating event in terms of human terms, but it's probably 
historic event that's going to reshape the conflict in some form. What, what's the responsibility of the United States to keep this contained and also to urge Israel to show restraint in its response to the terrible terrorist attacks that happened on the soil? Well, the first thing is the moral voice. We can't be consistent. You know, we have to be consistent. We can't say, uh, you know, um, it's wrong to attack Israeli civilians and at the same time not counsel restraint when the victims, civilian victims, are Palestinian. I mean, we can't do that. We've got to speak. So far, the president has not used a single word of restraint. You've got 7,600 people dead and wounded, 300 people becoming homeless, and we have not heard one word from the president of the United States. That is wrong. That is wrong. We, we, he's got to speak with a clear moral foot. It's not about Hamas. You can attack Hamas. You could do whatever you want with Hamas. That doesn't absolve you from the responsibility to protect civilians, to minimize civilian casualties. It doesn't uh, absolve you from uh, taking a moral view that there should be restraint. And so, yes, I think the president so far has failed in in his uh, 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 stand, moral stand, in terms of condemning any attacks on civilians, whether they're Israeli or Palestinian. We need to do that. He was right to attack Hamas, to to say to the Israeli people on the day of, uh, uh, you know, of, of vulnerability, to call them and say, I'm with you. Uh, people need to hear it when they feel attacked and vulnerable. Uh, sure, sure, sure. But you gotta, you've got to do it for both Israelis and Arabs. It doesn't matter. The color of your skin shouldn't matter for, you know, this is a human condition. And this mm. is a moral position. And it has to be absolutely clear. Now, I also would say that, you know, um, the administration has not understood uh, how explosive this situation has been. I have been saying this. I've been writing, and I, I have friends in this administration. I like them. I respect them. I've been. I've counseled them, and it's not that they didn't know. They just didn't do it. Mm. And right now, mm -hmm. there is no way of avoiding this issue. They thought this issue could be swept. They should. Israel Palestine could be quietly handled and managed. It has a way of coming back. Maybe people thought it was going to be, you know, kind of more of a. A, a quiet issue that uh, is under the radar screen, but right now it's front and center. And they can't just go to addressing the current crisis. They're going to have to come up with a way to think bigger because this is not going away. The, the fact that, you know, as you pointed out, President Biden hasn't, you know, talked about restraint. Do you think that that's telling of what's to come in regards to the Palestinians that are trapped there in Gaza as as far as the United States providing assistance to help them lift the blockade or even in regards to providing resources to the civilians who don't have them at all at this point? You know, right now, you can't even get ambulances to go to to save people because the level of destruction right now, just the bombings, the, between the buildings and the roads and the infrastructure and the water and the electricity and, and the hospitals, ambulances are not even able to get to uh, the victims right now. And there are like hundreds of them being produced by the hour. I mean, we're talking about, again, when you look at the scale of what happened in five days for both sides is really a huge scale, but Gaza is under constant bombardment. So there's, it's impossible even for aid organizations, whether it's a UN or other aid agencies or American aid or any of the uh, the groups that are out there to help the government, they can't even get in there. They can't provide. So they need to be a pause in the bombing, first of all. The first thing, mm -hmm. there's no way for the civilians to go. They're there. Uh, and they can't just, you can't just say, well, hey, let's get a, a, a safe zone for them. Well, they can't even get to a safe zone. They can't even right. get to a hospital. They can't even get to, uh, so you need to have and only the United States can do that because Israel is entirely dependent on the United States. It needs American support. Uh, uh, it, uh, and the U.S. has to use its moral authority to do this. Last question for you. We really appreciate you being so generous with your time um, and giving us such insight. Um, we had on um, Yaira Rosenberg from The Atlantic a little earlier, and I asked him this question about the condition of 
a civilian life in Gaza right now, being that Israel has cut off of food, excuse me, fuel, electricity, um, so many other things that you know, obviously keep a civilization going. And that means that the hospitals are running out of the, the ability to administer care. Uh, they're running out of food, running out of all kinds of things over there. Um, he said that partly that's due to Hamas's influence in the region, that the fact that Gaza is still relying on uh, Israel for its fuel, for its electricity, for its water, things like that, are indicative of the fact that um, Hamas has not uh, built the proper infrastructure in Gaza for the time that they have been running Gaza since around 2005, 2007, I think it is. Um, do you agree well, with that assessment? Do you well, think that well, that's first true? Well, I, I, I haven't heard what he said, so I'm not going to respond to him, but I could tell you this. Anybody who thinks Gaza was paradise before Hamas took over doesn't understand this. Hamas was still under occupation long before Gaza took over. The Palestinians were trying to build infrastructure and to get independence, including a port and, a, and, a, and, a, and an airport, and uh, to become in, more independent from uh, their dependence on Israelis long before Hamas took it. Never happened. Never happened. The West Bank um, is not... Uh, uh, under Hamas control, they don't have independence. Uh, so, uh, I think, you know, that's, that's obviously, you know, a rhetorical argument. Of course, Ham Hamas made things worse, uh, because of the kind of organization it is for sure, but that's not, uh, the, the reason for the continuation of the occupation of control. I mean, because you, as I said, in the West Bank, uh, that, that's not what they, it's not under control. Uh, and, and the period before they, uh, they came to the power in, in 2006. Um, you know, not in, it's just nothing happened to, to, to get more autonomy and independence. Hmm. By the way, I wasn't trying to get you guys to go back and forth. I was just trying to just make sure. No, I'm not re yeah. responding to, yeah. to, to him because I don't know what he said. As I said, right. I don't, I'm not responding. I'm telling you what the reality is about Hamas's role. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, um, uh, uh, not, I mean, the, the, the occupation problem goes way beyond Hamas, uh, and, you know, before and after. Okay. I think that's an important distinction to make. I just want to say, because a lot of people are just making it seem like it started when Hamas got into, right. uh, was elected into office. Um, we're going to leave it right there. Uh, should we thank you for coming on and, you know, talking about this? I know it's a tough time. Um, and it, it probably will be tougher for some time. Yes, um, you're right. Yeah, but I, we really do appreciate you being so generous with your yes. time and joining us on Higher Learning. Thank you very My much. My pleasure. Thanks for hosting me. Thank Take you. Take care. Okay. Um, we are nearly a week in to um, just really a harrowing and dangerous destabilizing situation after a deadly and disgusting terrorist attack took place on Israeli soil. Um, almost a week ago now, uh, and tensions are running high all over the world. In every sector of the world, this is a conversation um, that really has people emotionally uh, just bereft. <laughs> There's no way to say it. The emotions are running high. It seems like every conversation is a high stakes conversation. We're going to bring in somebody right now. We have joining us. Um, Daniela Greenbaum Davis, uh, who is a really accomplished professional, an Emmy winning, Emmy winning producer, formerly of The View, where Rachel is right now, uh, a writer and a com columnist for publications such as The Spectator, The New York Times, Washington Post, wow, and The Wall Street Journal. All of the gold standards right there um, <laughs> in, in American press. There was a tweet earlier this week um, that Ms. Davis, who joins us on Higher Learning right now, put out that I think we want to talk about, and I'm I'm pretty sure that you want to talk about it too, Daniela. So we appreciate you joining us on Higher Learning. Before we get into uh, the conversation, I just wanted to read the tweet. Um, obviously, this is probably in, this is a resp in response to some of the support or non-support that people in the Jewish community are feeling from certain aspects outside of the Jewish community. And the tweet read like this, Jews marched in Selma. Jews, Jews marched for George Floyd. Jews showed up for Black Lives Matter. BLM is a disgrace. We will all still be there for you guys next time because that's who we are. But now we know who you are. 
Um, then there was a clarification tweet that came after this written by Daniela that let it n- be known that the you in that situation is BLM. The black community that showed up for us. We see you and we thank you. BLM is a terrorist organization. And that's the you we now know. Now, I'm assuming, Daniela, that that tweet comes in response to a tweet that was uh, sent out by Black Lives Matter Chicago that showed a pretty indefensible graphic of uh, uh, the silhouette of a parachuter. And in case people don't know, part of what Hamas used to uh, get over the fence there and attack people in Israel, particularly at a music festival, was they paraglided in. Um, and it said, I stand with Palestine. And that really, really upset a lot of people. I'm assuming that you were responding to that when you sent that tweet. That's correct. Um, now, I'll be honest. When I read the tweet, I was offended. Um, particularly with the first tweet. And I'll tell you why. It, it seems, it, it doesn't seem like you're talking about BLM. When you say Jews marched in, in Selma, Jews marched for George Floyd, well, obviously, Black Lives Matter wasn't at some. So it, that makes it seem as if you're in some way castigating the entire Black community, but you're saying that that's not how you meant the tweet. That's exactly why I clarified right away. I, I have had a lot of support from Black allies in the last week, and I think the vast majority of Black organizations and Black individuals have shown up for their Jewish brothers and sisters. And so I wanted to clarify my words were about BLM. I want to give some context here, which is this. We all know the famous kind of image of MLK and Heschel marching hand in hand. What a lot of people don't know about Heschel is that he comes from a very small Hasidic dynasty called Kapitchenitz. My grandfather was part of the Kapitchenitz community in um, Vienna, Austria, where he lived before he fled here from the Nazis right before the Anschluss. And we grew up, (laughs) the idea of supporting other minority communities, the idea that allies need to work together, that was baked into my education, my blood, way before intersectionality was a cool term that we all use to talk about it. And right now, I am getting inundated with emails, texts, calls, pictures of burned babies, of body bags that are too small, of images of women with bloody pants, of videos that you can watch yourself as long as you have someone next to you who can translate the Arabic, of Hamas admitting it, enjoying it, reporting it gleefully. and. I think that as a white person, and I say that in the white black context, I don't believe Jews are really white. We don't need to get into it in this conversation. But if the definition is white black, obviously I'm white. Actually, I think it, white, it, it does have a place in this conversation. I, I do. Well, yeah. But I'm saying, like, this is a broader conversation. As someone who is not black, when George Floyd happened, the first thing I did was turn to black people around me and say, What do you need? And I can't begin to imagine how you're feeling. And on an individual level, I feel like that is totally happening with Black allies. And I thank them and I thank you. Unfortunately, BLM, and I get that it's decentralized and no one knows who's in charge and which chapter speaks for who. Unfortunately, BLM is a buzzword for a lot of people. And to a lot of people, it feels like representation. That's kind of, it's this big umbrella. And with BLM orbs, and pages that have all these followers tweeting things out there that are supporting and that very clearly make clear that it's all good that people are paragliding in and doing the things that they're doing. I don't know how else to react to that other than to say that if you support terrorism, you're a terrorist. So Not you. that's clear. Just, but, and, and, and you, you make it clear that between Van and I, that's not the case, but you know, you, I would think that you thought about the tweet that you put out. You carefully thought about your words and how you wanted to say them. And, you know, I don't take away from, you know, the terrible terroristic things that Hamas is doing. It's, it's awful. Van and I have both condemned the terrorist acts that are happening. But when I hear you talk about unity, 
and about how blacks and Jews come together. And, you know, you even, you know, shared that, that history and that story. And you talk about, you know, what you did during Black Lives Matter. When you see a tweet like that, I'm wondering what you wanted to accomplish because the end goal could not have been unity. It was a very divisive tweet. And so I'm wondering what you thought the goal was going to be and how that kind of tweet could bring Black people and Jewish people together. It's really simple. I think any Black person who doesn't feel represented by that tweet should come out and say, this doesn't represent me. And if this is what BLM is representing, then BLM doesn't represent me. There are also small fringe Jewish organizations that are out there saying crazy shit. Jewish Boys for Peace is one of them. They're saying things that I don't agree with at all about the conflict right now. I make very clear when asked and not when not asked, this doesn't represent me. I have nothing to do with this. And that's not the responsibility of every Black person in the entire world. I get that. Lots of us have groups that speak for us and don't speak for us. I'm not suggesting that that's a responsibility. But right now, your Jewish and brothers and sisters are in deeper crisis than we've ever been since the Holocaust. And we are begging you, begging you to please clarify that the things that are coming out of BLM Chicago is not the BLM that we want everybody supporting. Because we all want to support the idea that Black Lives Matter and that I I just think I understand what you're saying, but I think that it's not the responsibility to clarify your tweet. And I it just felt like you were fueling the fires of maybe certain perceptions that people have. Because you didn't say BLM Chicago, you said BLM. And for people who don't aren't aware that it's BLM Chicago and not just BLM as a whole or just black people in general, which is why you had to clarify the tweet, it just seems to be so much. It's one thing, like when I hear you talk right now and you're like, we, this is what we need from you. I hear you. I hear you. But when you put out a tweet like that, it takes away from it. And so, you know, I don't think it's the responsibility of black people to say that's not us. I think yeah. there's a responsibility to say this is what we need from you. I'm just going to show you some of the things that I'm getting as we're talking from people that I am personally have a relationship with that are on the ground cleaning up. This is a body of a baby. Mm. This is a burned body of a child. Mm. That's obviously a so, picture of Arabic so, writing. So let me let me give what I think is is some some wisdom or some context that I've gotten from a lot of my friends in the last couple of days. Can I just so interrupt I think, for one? Can I just interrupt for one more second? Can just say one more thing? Yeah. On the other side of my family, my dad's mom, she's a Holocaust survivor. I've written about her a lot of times. She survived death marches, forced labor. She was finally liberated from Bergen-Belsen by the British Army in 1945. And like basically every survivor, it was a mix of luck, God, and someone not Jewish who at some point did something to help. The first person that helped her was a person that worked for her father when they were still living in Lithuania, this was right as the Nazis rolled in, who handed her a cross to put around her neck and said, walk out of the ghetto with me right now, pretend you're my child, I'm going to hide you. She walked a couple blocks with her and then started having what we now would call a panic attack. Of course, my grandmother yeah. in Yiddish does not Didn't have that. Didn't know what it was then, right. Did not have that language. Yeah, right. And was like, I'm Jewish. I'm not going to like hide who I am. Went back into the ghetto, had the six hardest years of four hardest years of life. I don't remember what year that was. My point is when we're there for each other, the people that want all of us on this call to suffer have a lot harder time doing it. And so if you're telling me right now that those tweets are not helping activate the black community, then they'll come down. What I'm telling you right now is that as your Jewish sister, I never thought in my lifetime that the things my grandparents told me they experienced that I would ever grapple with. I thought I'm living in America. I grew up on the Upper East Side of New York. I am 
safe and secure. I never liked the idea of Jewish privilege because I had my grandparents' stories, but it was imprinted. It wasn't my life. I was okay, and I never felt unsafe as a Jew until the last few years in this country. Hmm. I, we need help and we need support. And I want to acknowledge that in the coming weeks, there's also going to be devastation coming out of Gaza because there's a war right now. And when that happens, there needs to be clarity about how this war started and how Hamas is responsible for the devastation on both sides. Mm -hmm. There are activists among the kidnapped, activists who are beyond progressive, beyond allied with the Palestinian people. There's one, in fact, who's going around. She's an older woman, maybe in her 70s. I believe she's Canadian. I can drop the link here later. My point is, this is crossing the boundaries of women, children, elderly, survivors, people on your side politically, people not on your side politically. There was a video going around of some of the kidnapped and the guys are saying in Arabic, you're here because of Netanyahu. I don't know if I can curse, but he's saying F Netanyahu. And and the families are like, we hate Netanyahu. That's not why, you know, we're on your side here. And and not to just, (laughs) nobody's justified, but my point is this is crossing all the lines. However you feel about any of this, it's babies, it's children, it's people on all sides of the politics. Okay. Um... Well said. So I'm going to say a couple of things here. I'm going to talk for a little bit. So there is something that I've, uh, that I do understand over the last couple of days. Um, that in moments like this, where, uh, things are so dire, what we all have to do is struggle to find our humanity. And what that means sometimes is push past, um, political beliefs, push past, what our intellectual um, understanding of the situation tells us is just be people. So I think what a lot of my Jewish friends wanted was they wanted um, time to emote, time to hurt, and time to feel about what happened last Friday. They wanted time to be people. And they wanted a lot of people uh, that have all kinds of beliefs about what's going on over there to just pump the brakes for one second and understand that they were hurting. Understand that uh, it, people it came in and killed people indiscriminately, that they took hostages, that this is the worst it's been for us. And they wanted that for a second. Um, I think that a lot of people that have been paying attention to or uh, had solidarity with the Palestinian people for a long time, that their hearts have been hardened to that plight. I think that that's, uh, that realization is real. And I think it's fair and appropriate and the human thing to do to take a second and go, look at the pain that's being caused for the worldwide diaspora of Jewish people. All right, like look at that, take a second, take that in and understand that while we're talking about these numbers and figures are actually lives being lost. And because of that, maybe you need to call and check in on your friends. Maybe you need to let people know that this isn't the way. Maybe you need to understand that this is actual terrorism. Maybe you need to know all of that stuff, right? For me, I am a huge advocate of the Palestinian people. And the way I look at this is that nothing that Hamas did advances their cause. It Mm -hmm. is Nothing that Hamas did advances their cause. It doesn't advance their cause at all. And so it's a it's a it's a failure. It's disgusting. It's the yeah. worst it can possibly get. Like you can't look at it any other way. That's that's a fact. I just want to you- interrupt to say thank you for saying that. And I agree yeah. with all of that. There's something interesting here though, Daniela, that I want to make sure that you come away from this conversation with. Okay, that kinship that black people and Jewish people, that Jewish people sometimes feel that they have with black people, we don't feel it by and large. Like even in your 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 discussion of how you grew up, you said you grew up on the Upper East Side and all that. Like, for example, you say that you didn't see a lot of black people condemning the tweet. I wonder how many black people you follow, because I saw black people that a lot of people would not think would like will like will come down on the tweet people that have reputations like Mark Lamont Hill a friend of mine who literally lost his job at CNN 
right, um, for saying something that people perceived as being anti-Semitic. I saw him mm -hmm. denounce the tweet. I saw Franklin Leonard denounce the tweet. I saw David Dennis denounce the tweet. I saw all types of people get at them, like people going, nah, that's not the way. No one that I know that has a platform that you would would be that so would 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 uh would uh would take up for that would defend that tweet and so sometimes there are these baked in separations even when you talk about like the way you grew up you grew up on the upper east side and you i wonder how many black people grew up in your neighborhood i wonder how much solidarity there was between you and black people growing up there i wonder but sometimes Dan, how that's that's exactly what i'm trying to say that i, I grew up personally like feeling very safe. I grew up in a good neighborhood. I didn't grow up and I'm owning that. I'm grateful for that. But what I'm saying is this is a watershed moment where every Jew, no matter where they live, no matter how secure they felt, is recognizing that nowhere, not even in the state that we think is all there only for the purpose of us being secure, are we safe? And I hear what everything that you're saying and I appreciate that. And I did see, to your point, a lot of people that I were was surprised and extremely heartened to see call that out. One of the things that I think people who are not part of the Black community really struggle with, myself included, is that Black Lives Matter purports to speak for the Black community. Yeah, There's no Danielle, face. Nobody knows who it Danielle, is. But listen, but listen, but listen for a second. Just And I'll finish up after this. Like even that right there, the belief that Black Lives Matter is an entity that, well, first of all, there's bifurcated, trifurcated, there's Black Lives Matter LA, there's Black Lives Matter Chicago, there's Black Lives Matter Boom. Which Black Danielle Matter, admitted. Uh, yeah. Right, right. So but just, just the fact that that would be in some way, that they would be some way homogenous with like 40 million people, to me, is indicative of the lack of familiarity that they have with the American Black diaspora. Like there are, to be honest with you, at this point, black people don't even like Black Lives Matter like that. Like they, they, they I mean, I'm just being for real. They don't. The organizations. The not organizations. The movement. Not, not, not the, the movement. Term. But yeah. when we all get, when, like when we, oh, you're We're all be, on the same page. That right. Black I mean, lives I don't have, matter. like, I, like, but, but when we get all lumped in like that, and when our history gets thrown back up in our faces, cause just to let you know, the ghettos that everybody's been in or, or was in, we're still in them. We're still in those ghettos today. We're in, we're in the ghetto. Like we're still as poor as we were as in relation to white people as we were in 19, in the 1960s. We still, our healthcare is still poor. We're still living in bombed out places in Chicago and South Baton Rouge, where I'm from. It's still going on. We haven't had any economic, social or justice or, 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 um, or, um, or political ascension. It hasn't really happened for us. So when something happens halfway around the world, and we get drawn into it, well, we start to look around and go, well, really, who has been with us for the last 50 years? I know that people, I know that, I know that people march. I know that they're in Mississippi, four people were killed, three of them were Jewish. The Dr. King was bankrolled largely by a Jewish man. I know that, but like for the la for the time that we've been hooked on drugs and like in these communities and like couldn't find jobs and couldn't find like who has really been with us? And it kind of feels if really, you're telling me that you don't feel like the Jewish community has been with you through that, that's devastating for me. Because well, no one has. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not singling out the Jewish community. Okay, no one has. I can tell you within the Jewish community, one of the things we talk about all the time is the fact that of Jewish philanthropic dollars, only 13% go to Jewish causes, meaning almost 90% of the charity that Jews give is not going to Jewish organizations. It either goes to other communities or to things like universities and colleges and hospitals and things that benefit everybody. And as a very small community, there are only, what, a tiny amount of us given the rest of the world population. That's something we talk about all the time internally. Is that is that good or bad? But it is the number. It's almost 90% of Jewish charity does not go to Jewish causes. So I can tell you that Every Jew that I know, both with their finances, with their goals, with their time, with their activism, is 
love your neighbor like yourself. Remember the stranger because you were strangers in Egypt. I mean, our entire being is to recognize that minorities need to stick together. And if you're telling me that you don't feel that, then I hope when this calms down, you and I can sit together for like a week and a half and figure out how to bring our communities more together because I am shocked if that's how you feel and I want to fix it and do more and also understand where the gap in communication is because I can tell you, we feel like we're showing up. If we're not, tell us where to show up differently. I mean, look, look, I'm going to let Rachel jump in real quick. Uh, Go I ahead, say what you want to say. No, no, say that no, part. I mean, and I'll, look, so look, and I don't want to move this off of uh, off of while we're here because I want to make sure that because a lot of conversations are going to be spawned from like while we're here. Even talking about people understanding why this happened, there'll be a lot of people that would fight you on the reasons why this actually happened. The reason why there are a thousand Jews dead right now, babies, families, is because of Hamas. That is one thousand percent. Hamas did that and Hamas is responsible for that, right? Right. The reason why there's militancy in the region, you could have a geopolitical discussion about that that would last three or four days and take us all the way back to the Brits, three different wars. It'll probably take us back about 2,000 years. But I don't think I, it's, would... I don't think I, I don't think it takes us back two thousand years because there wasn't really even any Islam two thousand years ago. But I think it would take I think it would take us back. But there were I, Jews, and I, I, I would object to your term militancy. What's going on now is terrorism, and I think that's we should be really specific no, that's, that's, about our terms. I, right, right. But that's, that's not what though. he's saying. So, he's so saying when terrorism I, when I, is to the Hamas. But Hamas had wasn't them. born on Friday. Hamas has been in the region for a long time, and I understand. And this I know, but Daniela, before there guys, was Hamas, but 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 for, hold on, Daniela, before there was Hamas, there was Black September. Before there was Black September, there was. I there, there's, there, there, what there always there was what Fatah. There was always what, been a group there, and that's I, because the conditions I, there haven't really borne anything else. What I would like to say, though, is that Hamas, which is doing the things now that it seems like all of us on the call are agreed are terrorism, inexcusable, not a way to advance anybody's interests. Is that a fair summary of where we all are on what's happened? <laughs> Doubt. Okay. Hamas has been in the region and operational since before Friday and Saturday. So all I'm trying to say is for all of the people that are saying there's context that goes back here a long time, whether you want to say to the Brits or 2000 years or whatever, of course there is. But I would also say, remember that along with that context, the group that's responsible for this has been doing things in this region for a long time. And Israelis have been doing everything they can to keep people, including Arabs who live in Israel, safe. By the way, among the dead, we already know our Bedouin Arabs, our Arab Israelis. It's not like this is affecting just people that they're intending to take out. Among the dead are people from, I think it's up to 25 different countries. It, this, is a, this is a widespread, completely indiscriminate slaughter. And honestly, Dan, what I'm... No, go ahead. I'm finished. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to stop you. Go ahead. I think what's really hard for people who aren't, I think what's hard for people who are rational, and I think that's probably all of us on this call, is to understand and get in the mind of someone who's not rational. So the three of us here can sit here and say, well, Hamas is doing is never going to help the Palestinians achieve what they want. Hamas probably doesn't believe that, right? They're probably doing this thinking it will achieve what the Palestinians want. And at a certain point, when you're operating with actors who have no rationality and no morality, there's not much that can be done other than to completely take them out, which is why, unfortunately, what's about to happen in Gaza is going to be really devastating to civilians on both sides. And there's not a single Israeli that I know that's not gut-wrenched about what that's going to look like. Let me ask you about that because, you know, one of the things that I guess, you know, as again, we've all, we've all agreed about the things that we've agreed about on this call, but, you know, there's a lot of, if you reference the innocent civilians that I've seen, if you reference the innocent civilians on both sides, if you talk about the fact that, you know, the Israelis are sending bombs over there and rockets over there. And it is hitting residents. There are hitting residents where innocent women and children are 
being impacted by that. And then there's also the fact that there's a blockade and they're not allowed to leave. So, you know, I've seen some things on the news where um, Israeli military is saying, well, we're giving them warning, but there's nowhere for them to go. They're trapped. So what do you say about yeah. that for those innocent civilians that are caught in the middle? Because I think we can both agree that when it comes to war and we both agree in regards to humanity, there are, it's the people that become impacted by this and are innocent in it all. First of, first of all, absolutely. And it's a really important question. I want to say one quick thing on the political situation, and then I'm going to get into the much harder, broader question of the humanity and the civilian cost. On the blockade, Everybody seems to for be forgetting that there are two countries responsible for the blockade of Gaza. There's Egypt and there's Israel. The Egyptians are... Nobody seems to be asking them, why aren't you opening your border with Gaza? Israelis are asking, Americans are asking. They're saying, opening a corridor, take as many civilians in as you can. We are... <laughs> Everybody that is kind of representing here how, how I'm thinking about the issue that I'm aware of on both the Israeli and American sides are saying to the Egyptians, please work with us to figure out logistics of opening a corridor to take in as many civilians as possible because it's about to get really fucking ugly in Gaza. That's the first thing. You have to remember, though, the reason the Egyptians aren't doing it is because they've seen what Hamas has just done and they know what Hamas has been doing for years. It's the reason Egypt maintains a blockade of Gaza in the first place. They don't want any of that shit in their country. They, they don't want to have Egyptians hurt the way that what's going on. So that's the first thing I want to say about the blockade. In terms of civilians, I'm going to say it again, and 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 I think it's really important that Jews and Israelis continue to be like super just direct about this. In the coming days and weeks, there are going to be a lot of civilians on both sides, including on the Palestinian side, that are hurt and that are killed, and it is an absolute tragedy. That is like just the first thing to say. The second thing to say is war is not an episode of Band of Brothers. In war, civilians die. We, we all know that. The difference between what Israel is doing and what Hamas is doing is that Hamas has targeted civilians. They have kidnapped civilians. They have raped civilians. They are going out there and amplifying this. If you guys want to check out after this call, there is two telegram channels, both called Gaza. One has like 140,000 people in it as of yesterday. The other has 300,000. And it's all people that are in Gaza and that were part of the kidnapping, that are uploading things in real time, that they're doing. And it is devastating and triggering and horrible. So what I would say, because yeah, a lot of civilians are about to either get injured or hurt, and it is devastating, is that this is where I really want us all to remember there's one vital difference. Hamas is targeting innocent civilians. Their goal is to rape women, kidnap Holocaust survivors, and murder children. And Israel, yes, ultimately is going to be responsible also for the loss of civilian life because that's what happens in war. But they are not targeting civilians. They are unfortunately getting caught in the battlefield. Okay, a couple things. One, I would say that Egypt doesn't open their border Yes, because of some influences that might come across the border. But there's also talk that that would undermine uh, the, the influence of the Palestinian Authority. And there are all kinds of political reasons why they might not want to do that as well. Two is that civilians are killed <laughs> in Gaza all the time. They are. Civilians, like non-combatants, like over 250 people have been killed or were killed in Gaza before this. People are killed there all the time. All the time. So it... it Th that in and of itself, as far as targeting is concerned, but if we're being realistic and real about what happens, is that civilians get killed in Gaza by the IDF. It happens. There are skirmishes around settlements that, that get established in the West I Bank. Don't, People I, get I don't killed. deny that civilians I, get so, killed on both sides. That is so, undeniably so true. I, but Israel so, does not target civilians. Well, I don't Can know I? how somebody gets killed if if they're not targeted. You got to point your gun at it and you got to shoot them. But look, so so so. Ben, this, have you ever served in any war capacity ever? Have I ever served in any about war capacity this ever? Incident. Civilians uh, no, get killed without being targeted all the time. That's the yeah, nature of war. I, I, prior I, I, to the prior I, 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 to I know, the but, war, but, but what prior to what we're talking about right now, which is the war, I'm talking about an uh, aspect of life in Gaza is that civilians get killed in Gaza. But who was running Gaza prior to this war? Okay. Um, so 
one thing, the last Guys, thing. I'll, this is well, this is a this is a critical point. No, no Gaza this, and the West, Gaza and the I, I West know, Bank, which Ga- there is Gaza, a military so, occupancy in the West Bank. First of all, okay. Israeli. First of all, can I just interrupt for one second? Have either of you ever been to Israel? <laughs> no. No. Okay. We're all on air, so this is like a hold me to it moment. When this is over, if you feel safe to come, it would be my honor on my dime to fly both of you out, you know, coach and in a shitty hotel, but on my dime to come and we'll do whatever you want. You want to go to the border, whatever's safe at that point. I, it would be my honor to bring you both to see everything happening in real time. Yes, to see suffering on both sides and also just to experience everything on the ground. I think we have mutual friends in Rabbi Lamb and the people at Soul Shop. We can do it as a big group. We can do it, the three of us. We can do it however you want. But it would be, as soon as it's safe, really my honor to take you guys and to have this conversation in real time on the ground. All right. Okay. I will say that, I, I will say this though. Like I have worked deeply with organizations like the Dream Defenders and other organizations that go there all the time. Um, and there's advocacy work. I am legitimately on one side of this. I am on the side of freedom and peace in Israel and for the Palestinian people. Freedom and peace yeah. for the Palestinian peace for the Palestinian people and for Israel. I'm also aware of some of the realities that stop that from happening. Last thing I'll say, um, because I really do appreciate your time and I think that you've been very gracious with your time talking about a very difficult situation and something that you've been um, uh, personally affected by uh, both with what's happened and what happened on Twitter. So getting back to the conversation about Black Lives Matter and representation. All right. You're, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know who Edward Bloom is. Students for Fair Admissions. I'm sure you know who Dennis Prager is from Prager U. All right. When Edward Bloom, Jewish man, very prominent Jewish man who has worked his entire life to hurt black people, when he essentially got affirmative action ended at the Supreme Court level, I did not go to one of my Jewish friends and say, hey, guys, guys. you guys should all just went real quick, real quick. I did not go to one of my Jewish friends and say, hey, guys, you guys should all be denouncing this guy who is working to promote and enhance systemic racism in America. Dennis Prager, who uh, through Prager U, is changing the educational standard in Florida by giving propaganda videos. All of these guys have been looked at as individuals, individual actors with individual organizations. I'm not going to ever make that the problem of all of my Jewish friends or anything like that. The only thing that we would say is as Black people that Black Lives Matter as an organization, no matter how big or how small they are, no matter how much money anybody sent to them in 2020, that as an organization, that Black Lives Matter be kept separate, right? That That's the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation. That's Black Lives Matter Chicago. Black, that that be kept, kept separate from what Black people all over America are doing. And the reason why I bring that up is because for us, when we're talking about lives being in danger, and I know that the, my Jewish friends can can identify with this, when we're talking about lives being in danger, when we're talking about lives being on the line, that's our reality all the time. So what we would appreciate, like that, this is for everyone, and I know that you understand this now, what we would appreciate is that like the history of who we are not kind of be thrown back up in our face and everyone who's seemingly helping us so much to not like remind us and like, it's like everybody's taking notes and stuff like that. Black people have a lot of problems not didn't have a lot of problems, have a lot of problems now. And a lot of people that I know are trying to understand this, make sense of it, contextualize it. A lot of people are trying to get away from what looks like brown people against white people. There's a lot of education that needs to be done. And I understand that there's a lot of hurt, but what I would ask for is not to pick up Twitter and have Selma or anything like that, be used as something to activate a community that are literally still in the ghetto and still trying to figure it out. It's it's hurtful to us. 
Um, and there's work to be done. I talk to Dr. Lamb about this all the time. I'm willing to do the work with him. I reached, I reached out to him on Saturday. I forgot that he's not going to be looking at this shit on Saturday. <laughs> and I, and I reached out to almost every Jewish person I know. I've been on the phone for hours this weekend, this, this, this whole week. And I do think in a way that a lot of people in the space failed to just confront the humanity of our Jewish brothers and sisters. And I'll give you that. But I want to make sure that this doesn't deepen any divides yeah. that already exist, Danielle. And I'll let you have the last word. Well, first of all, thank you both. I don't think I've had a conversation this um, honest and thoughtful and <laughs> not uh, three second sound bites and dot yet in a really long time on any news format. So. I'm grateful for the platform and for including me. Um, I'm taking to heart what you said, and it it means a lot. And I think I said this to my husband because I snapped at him about something last night, and I'm going to say it here. Make a little space for your Jewish friends to fuck up also in the next few weeks because we are not sleeping. We're not eating. Those of us who are not in Israel wish we were. We're scrambling to deal with logistical problems. We're scrambling to deal with childcare for our friends whose husbands have been called up. We're we're dealing with a lot. And um, and it's been really hard. And I appreciate this allyship. And um, it's okay. I really hope you guys. I don't know if we're still, whatever. I hope you guys take me up on the Israel thing after and um, maybe we can all do a Shabbat dinner at the very least, but I'd love to continue this conversation about how we can do the work together offline when the camera's not rolling and there's not an act of war. Word up. That is... Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, Daniela. I know that this was a hard conversation. I know that things are hard right now. Um, that is Dan Daniela Greenbaum Davis. Uh, we hope to continue and have more conversation with you. But um, take some space, pray for peace, pray for everyone's safety. Uh, and thank you for joining us on Higher Learning. Thank you. You know, I didn't know how the conversation was going to go with Daniela, but I actually ended up appreciating it at the end of the day. There's just one little thing that I want to say because um, there kept being the mention and it was a tweet from Daniela that Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization. And she just unilaterally said that. And to be clear, and she also said this in our conversation with her, that she was only referring to BLM Chicago. And Black Lives Matter Global Network actually put out a statement saying that they have not made any kind of statements uh, in regards to support for Hamas or anything that was related to that graphic that BLM Chicago put up. So they completely denounced that. So I just want to say that they are not a terrorist organization in regards to Black Lives Matter Global Network. Yeah, Can't speak wanna... for BLM Chicago, what they put no, up. No, no, we want to say that that rhetoric, we're standing apart from that. We didn't get a chance to address it in there, but Rach is right on top of it as always. All right, a little quick breather. Because I want to talk about this real quick. A little quick breather. I hope that you guys really got something from those three interviews. Uh, we were very involved. Thank you to Yair. Thank you to Shibley. Thank you to Daniela for coming on to the show. We're going to keep up with yep. the situation. We want to give you a robust show on it. We promised we'd have some people and we did. Now, I, I want to get into this real quick. And it's Jada Pinkett Smith because oh. um, I I I I'm sorry. I can't even believe you brought this into the show. Well, look, there's other things that we can talk about that I think are wrong, right? I think doxing college students for their takes when their brains aren't fully formed yet, I think that's wrong. I also think that really powerful people that are attacking college students for their takes and saying that they're not going to get hired for jobs and keeping lists on people, all of that stuff is wrong, but don't, don't get me wrong. But I also think something is wrong on a more was minute level and that's is this. Using your personal shit like that you've been keeping on the tuck for this long to sell a book. I think Jada Pinkett Smith, I think Jada Pinkett Smith is just fucking kicking Will Smith in his nuts from the back. 
every situation she can. <laughs> and I don't understand how in any way we could deny it. Am I wrong for saying that? Is anybody denying it? See, to me, the timing of this and that it is with the book and also just like everything that's going on in the world, it's like that we that we got to talk about this too and that the announcement was all at this time. It's just like you people really have no energy left to give this couple. Um, to me, this is right on par with the things that Jada has done. I am not shocked that she held this close to the chest until the release of the book. It's becoming to the point where let me be very honest with you. I don't believe her. Ooh. I don't I don't know if I believe every single thing that she's saying. I think that there seems to be some exaggeration on some parts. Like maybe you were separated in 2016. Maybe you got back together. Maybe the lines were blurred. Um, the Chris Rocks thing, I find very interesting. I think no, that that could be a, let's that's be a misinterpretation. No, I just, there's just, now. There, please give the audio, please, Donnie. We, we, Donnie, Donnie, Donnie let, let, let's let Jada have her say about her and Will real quick. In 2016, you and Will decided that you were going to live completely separate lives. Yes. It was not a divorce on paper, right. but it was a divorce. divorce. So from the year 2016, which is seven years ago now, <laughs> yes. y'all have been apart. Yeah. <laughs> so that means that a lot of this stuff that we're talking about, um, they weren't together for it, right? We're talking August Alcina and entanglements and all of that type of stuff. Think about the fact that in any of this time that Will Smith was catching hell on the internet because a young nigga from New Orleans was I guess having sex with his wife, that would have been a fantastic time in any of that to be like, you know what? Not really, because we weren't really together. She said that. She's, they said, correct me if I'm wrong, Donnie, Ashley, she said before on Red Table Talk that they were separated. Mm, I thought that they the were, I thought that it was more of a situation, not that they were, this makes it seem like he or she said, "This we're divorced without it being on paper." I mean, the gap to me was that they were separated during the slap, and I thought that was the revelation, not the August Alcina. Please, you know, Donnie asked to jump in here. The gag was that, oh, he went up and slapped him, and y'all were separated. Y'all weren't even together. See, but that that to me, it's all in the same organic globule of bullshit because him feeling that he needed to, first of all, they were at the Oscars together. So that mm -hmm. already in and of itself cuts against the idea of them being separated. They're going there as a unit, right? When you say divorce, right. but together, I think the emotional part of that is actually more important. So it's one thing if you have an open relationship, but hey, we're still a family. I just like to get our dick every now and again from somebody else. And Will, we also know, has been out there fucking other people. Well, so... So that's she not was, that big of a deal if you have an open relationship. But if you're divorced, a divorce is a break, not just of, there's a a romantic thing there that doesn't exist as well that I think people I thought that. still existed at no, a baseline between Will and Jenny. You sure they did. Then if that's the case, what's the point of dragging this nigga on a red table talk, red faced, and having a conversation about all of this other stuff if there was no they emotional were, connection to them anymore. They were dragging it because I think the emotional connection or the lack thereof is from Jada. I mean, Jada has flat out said, I never wanted to be married. I didn't want a traditional relationship. So people feel and so like it's embarrassing for Will. Any opportunity she gets to have a microphone, she's just going to dog Will Smith. That's what that. So I, I totally believe that there was a lack of connection and I believe it came from Jada's part. It always seems like Will was trying to, and I could be so wrong. Like, it's just like, seemed like he was desperate for this relationship to work. And she was like, nah, you knew I never wanted this anyway. Man. I never <laughs> gave any, I, I never gave them any credence to them pussy open to the world pictures. You ever seen the pictures before? Pussy open to the world. No. You ever seen them? Donnie, no. you know what I'm talking about? 
I don't, and I can't wait, Google wait, that. Wait, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Y'all never seen the pictures of Will Thank and Jada you, sitting in the... Hold on, <laughs> Ashley, Quirk Queen. Have you ever have you ever seen these pictures? <laughs> like Court Queen, y'all never heard this. Y'all never seen the pictures of Will and Jada, and they're sitting in the front row of some award show, and Will is looking in a certain way, and Jada is sitting. Her eggs are o- her legs are open, and it says like they're doing like this weird toxic manosphere body language breakdown. I do know and, what you're talking about now. Yeah, and it yeah. says and it says Jada. Doing like this, blah, 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 like pussy open to the world because her legs are open. I don't like that. I don't like that. And I you don't, don't like even that? like Jada like that. I don't Why? like you, that. And I'm not a Why? Jada defender. But have come you on. seen the picture? Have you seen the picture? No, but just Look because the the, just because she can't stand Will Smith doesn't mean that her pussy's open to the world. Wait, it, there's not. It's not necessarily. First of all, don't curse, man, <laughs> Rachel. Like, don't curse. <laughs> it made it made me feel bad when you curse, man. <laughs> like, I'm serious. I'm serious, man. Rachel, I have put, I have put in my mind this version of you, the walls of Jericho, all of this <laughs> stuff. I, when, when, when you cur- when you curse, every time you curse, every time it's a curse. nigga or a fuck, every time you say that, I feel like I feel responsible. Like I'm, <laughs> I appreciate. I feel like that. the judge is gonna, he's gonna blame me for you cursing because I never hear you talk <laughs> like that. Rachel don't even really be cursing that much when we're around each other, like in a different way. Right? Not really, not that much. You curse sometimes. No, I gotta, as, I gotta much. really be. If I'm really drinking, I am. Yeah. If I'm around um, my Texas people, I am. Yeah. So you haven't seen, but what I'm saying is the picture is basically just saying that she doesn't seem like she's like connected to Will. There, it's like pussy open to the world. It seems like she's wide open. That's how I'm interpreting it. That's how it's coming across. Listen, you enjoyed this. You like you you no, I don't. you like the Jada and Will no, I don't. mess. No, I don't. I think they're both really awesome people. Like seriously, I think that they're individually. Awesome people. Yeah. I just think yeah. we need to be free. Free us from this. <laughs> That's how I feel too. Like free <laughs> seriously, bro. But if there's two relationships that we need to be freed from. Like oh, Jada and Will, Jada and Will ain't nothing but Blueface and Krishan with some money. It's, it's really it. I, I'm serious. Like free us from this, man. And talent. Free us. Free us, man. They, 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 and who's the other couple? It's, it's Blueface and Krishan, and then oh. it's Jada and Will. Jada and Will or Blueface and Krishan with money. Free us from <laughs> this. Free us. Okay. That's I, I don't want to hear no more, man. I'm gonna read the book. Um, and no, apparently, you're not. Uh, apparently, according to Jada, I'm gonna read that book. Apparently, according to Jada, uh, Chris Rock tried to holler. You talked about that. What do you think about that? Chris Rock tried to. Get I don't. Jada. I think everything she says is an exaggeration or some form of the truth. I believe he probably picked up the phone and called her, and might have said something like, you know, like "What's up?" and she's uh, whatever. But I don't think that he asked her out. I just. I don't know. It's just of all the people, really, it was Chris Rock. Really, I just. Why well, can't you believe that? You don't it. think Chris Rock been trying to? He been like fucking around with Jada for a long time. Was it widespread out there that they were separated in 2016? Because that's what she said. She's like, "Oh, he found out we were separated. Like it was just out there." I don't know. I, I asked her about I'm it just on not TNT. Giving, I'm not. I'm just not giving. I'm just not giving it anything. You asked about what? I saw Jada outside. Um, what's the what's the eyebrow lady place? The lady that do the eyebrows. Anastasia. Everybody. Anastasia. Hmm. Fancy ass niggas, bro. You asked me what it is. I didn't say I go you there. You know, you know about it. I have an appointment tomorrow. See. See I'm, I'm not talking. even lying. See, <laughs> that's what it was on Bedford Drive in Beverly Hills, <laughs> and this right. is this is why. See, you know, you know, <laughs> you a fancy ass. Oh. Um, so we are. So she's outside. I see her outside of Anastasia. I'm like, oh, that's Jada Pinkett. It's a good shot. This is why I was the man. I was praised at the office after I asked this question. So the the rumor was that they were already broken up, and you know, a lot mm-hmm. of people would go up to um to Jada and they would say, Jada, 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 is it true that you and Will are broken up? That's not, the, that's not how you do it. That's not the way to do it? Show us how you used to do it. 
you walk up to Jada and you have the camera and you're like, Jada, Valentine's Day is coming up. He's like, yeah. Are you going to be spending it with somebody? She's like, yeah, I will. Boom! That's how we, that's how we ask questions on the carpet. Boom! He would have been that's great you, extra. That's how you get it. That's how you get the fucking story, baby. That's how you interrupt a celebrity's life when they're living their daily life out So they life spent Valentine's together in what year? I can't remember that what happened? that was. That might have been like... <laughs> they might, but look, they might have been... But it was around that I time. I wouldn't put it past them to spend Valentine's to day together on dates with other people. <laughs> like, I like mean, they, it was... They, that's it's great. always been rumored that they had an open relationship. Yeah. But the way that them. she's talking about it in this book, it's just... <sighs> Exhausted. As you said, free us. Free now free us. me from free this us. podcast. Gotta Come go. On. That's it. No mailbag, <laughs> no nothing else. Uh, Rachel really wants to talk about the AKAs because it's an AKA topic on this because Rachel always... I told, I told Sonny. I told that to Sonny today sitting at the table during the commercial break. Because she's an AKA? AKA. She's an AKA. Is it, is it said, crazy oh, to she... you that the AKAs wherever you go are no, like stop that. O- stop over that. you? Stop that. Stop that. They're not... Like, we have a Supreme it, Court justice at the Delta. Please stop, stop. Yeah, stop. but she's actually not the we got vice president. That's AKA. Word on the street is she's not doing anything. Vice president ain't doing anything. See, see what happens. See what happens. <laughs> we gotta go. We gotta go. See what she just did. Is that is that gang shit Which I don't over believe everything. that, y'all. By yeah, the way, whatever. I don't you just that. guessed it. It's like is that I gang shit that. over everything, it was just man? Too I'm easy. Telling you. All right, we out. Take the caps off. We do not stop learning. Thank you for all of our guests today. We really appreciate you guys coming on and having difficult conversations. Yes. Listen, thank you a lot. Absolutely. And I'm Rachel and Lindsay. Bye, guys.